in the end, my friends, um, the C01 and the C02 are the current solutions architect exams from AWS. The best news I have for you is that if you happen to be studying for the C01 and the C02 got released, Hey friends, Cloudbart here. Well, I did it. I went and I took the latest release of the AWS Solutions Architect exam. And it was a great exam, great test, good experience. Can't wait to tell you a little bit more about it. So over the next couple of minutes, let's talk a little bit about the change from C01 to C02, a little bit of what that Delta looks like. And then a little recap on my experience with the exam content and the testing process. And then also a couple little tidbits about where you can go and study uh, to make sure that you can go and pass the C02 as well. So first thing I wanted to start off is just a big round of applause for AWS and the training teams for putting together an excellent exam on the topic of cloud solutions architecting, which is an interesting new arena. Uh, network operations, security, systems administration, a lot of the stuff that we talk about in the cloud uh, it's not really all that new. It's things we've been doing. We're just adding cloud and managed service elements to it. But solutions architecting, I think, is a different type of beast. When we think about what that role does, the types of skills that we need to be successful as a solutions architect, and the thought process that we have to put ourselves into, kind of that mentality, that's where I thought this exam really shone. Now, I have taken the solutions architect exam quite a few times over the years. It was the first test that I took as an AWS trainer. And since then, I've sat for it three different versions um, so I've had a good chance to kind of take a look at the Delta and the uh, kind of the evolution of it over time. Now, the C01, which is the one that's currently, uh, it's still available till I think they extended it till July of 2020. That was the um, kind of a big overhaul on the solutions architect exam. One big change was that they brought the well-architected framework pillars. So five different domain objectives, that was security, performance, reliability, cost optimization, and then finally operational excellence. Now, these are absolutely fantastic pillars and design principles, which if you've followed anything that I've talked about, you've heard me mention the well-architected framework. And so in the C01, they really brought that focus to the test, which I thought was a great step away from the traditional model of uh, what does the service do? How do we use it? <laughs> and what does it not do? And what are some of the gotchas? Which of course is great um, hard memorization parts for us. But I think the trickier part is when we get into solutions architecting and looking at the more holistic patterns, input output, latency, uh, durability requirements, failover expectations, reducing cost, uh, improving automation and reducing uh, some of the timelines and uh, implications of having to deal with problems unexpectedly in our environments. So on the C02, AWS changed some of the domain objectives here a little bit. They took the operational uh, excellence pillar out and kind of spread all of those principles across the other four objectives. So the first thing to kind of recognize here is that when we are talking about uh, this exam, the first one is that there is still a security pillar. Okay, so this means that a large portion of the test is making sure that we understand what types of security can be implemented, both from an identity, authentication and authorization perspective, but then also from a network traffic filtering and general uh, architectural perspective as well. So this meant security groups, network access control lists, uh, firewalling using the WAF, uh, the notion of using edge location services with AWS Shield. Really important principles here to understand what AWS can do to help you improve your security and then which parts are responsible for me as a customer, keeping in mind that AWS is always trying to keep us thinking about that shared responsibility model, which is pretty unique to the AWS cloud offering and other cloud vendors as well. After that, you of course have your performance pillar as well. And in this particular one, they were really trying to get us thinking a lot about what does the workload currently require? And then there are many ways to provision to meet those objectives, depending specifically on how performant you need that solution to be. So a lot of questions on the test where they were giving us performance uh, objectives, such as I need this level of CPU, I need this number of messages to be able to handle, I need this number of requests to be handled, and then making us as the architect pick between different solutions that help meet that performance objective. So of course we needed product knowledge to answer this, but we needed that more holistic theory behind parallelism, sequencing, bottlenecking, and kind of looking for those patterns to understand how to answer those questions and meet the performance targets as a part of it. Along those lines as well, of course, we had cost optimization. Uh, so on this particular test, uh, I think a big theme here was again, making sure that we understand the EC2 purchasing models. Since the C01 was released and the C02 has now come on the market, EC2 pricing has changed in a big way. 
the way that we choose spot instances is no longer based on bids. Uh, the idea that we can produce fleets and blocks and limited time duration spot requests, these were all themes that are kind of new on the C02 that they definitely wanted us to understand. Making sure too that we contrast it against that things like uh, dedicated instances, of course, when and why we should choose to use reserved instances. And of course, when to use on demand, keeping in mind that they are often a very cost effective solution when you don't know what to expect and you can't tolerate some of the unpredictability of using spot instances. So this meant that a lot of cost optimization focus was on picking the right model uh, for the cost scenarios. There were a lot of questions where they'd be like, which is the most cost effective solution? And you might have to pick a solution that wasn't necessarily quote unquote best practice because it was more cost efficient. Remembering friends, we got all sorts of different types of workloads out there. A solutions architect needs to be able to navigate the requirements of the business to make the right alignment. And again, I thought that the C02, uh, the latest release of the exam does a great job of stepping outside of just what are the services and how do they work and really making sure that we keep these other architectural patterns uh, at the forefront of our mind. Along those lines as well, uh, kind of teeing off the performance piece, there was a lot of um, focus on input output like a number of IOPS versus throughput versus durability and CPU requirement pieces. So you really needed to know a lot more about classic application performance problems to begin answering some of these questions, which again, is not something that you're gonna get directly from learning how to use EC2 or how to use the load balancer. So a lot of that extra context was kind of added here as well. And I thought that that was really uh, beneficial. The fourth one then is of course, reliability. And of all of the ones on the exam, I have to say, I feel like I saw more reliability questions uh, than anything else. For example, questions on there about RDS multiple AZ deployments or geo replication uh, for Amazon Aurora or for S3. A lot of questions focusing on around uh, making information or services or workloads available with specific reliability or durability expectations. Along those lines too, a lot of like auto scaling group and load balancer questions about um, the right AZ models, a couple tricky ones in there where they're like trying to get you to bite on using a secure uh, scaling group to deploy stuff across regions. <laughs> so watch out for that. We can't do that sort of thing there. And uh, keeping in mind too, that when we look at reliability, often one of the most important factors is the abstraction layer that we create by using things like load balancers. And so a lot of focus on load balancing in here, uh, all of the different flavors too, moving a lot away from classic Load balancer, didn't see that come up on the exam hardly any once. It was pretty much all about when to use ALBs, the application load balancers, and when to use the NLBs, the network load balancers. So quite a few different unique questions on that level. Uh, for example, like high availability bastion servers using a network load balancer. This was a pattern that wasn't available uh, or used in the C01. So these are some of the new things that I saw uh, and really jumped out for me especially a lot of the multi AZ components that you heard me mention just a minute ago. So I definitely encourage you to always work backwards. Remember what AWS defines as inherently highly available. Services run at the AZ level, like EC2, elastic block store volumes, other EC2 based services, okay? And then you're moving up to some services that run at a regional level, like S3 or DynamoDB. And then services that can run globally, like Route 53, identity and access management, CloudFront. And of course, keeping in mind that some services like S3 and DynamoDB can be provisioned with geo replication that might make some of those services available across regions. So all of this, uh, a lot of that was in the advanced uh, networking, or I'm sorry, in the advanced architecting courses before. They've brought some of that down into this other um, initial architecting exam as well. So. A lot of reliability conversations there. <laughs> um, and then the final one there was that they took um, operational excellence out. So no special domain objectives on that one. Operational excellence is kind of baked into all of these other uh, categories that you kind of heard me talking about. Cool. So as I looked at the difference between C01 and C02, there were a couple of services that just weren't around or in use um, in the C01. So we didn't hear them referenced on there. So let me take a look at my notes real quick. I know one in particular was, um, oh yeah, AWS FSX, which is their uh, replicated file system service. It's kind of like EFS, except for it's designed for specific types of file systems. This came up on there. They were asking about the difference between Luster and the Windows based versions of them. So that was a new service that I hadn't seen on the exams yet. There was also a couple questions around storage gateways, hardware appliance. Now that was a new offering 
that wasn't available on the original C01 as well. And uh, kind of cruising down through, let me think a little bit. Oh yeah, quite a few questions on there about private access from a VPC to other AWS services. So definitely make sure you're familiar with how um, private link works and then some of the other network access mechanisms that we can use like Direct Connect, um, VPC service endpoints, quite a few questions around how to build them and then access them within a VPC. So uh, definitely make sure you bone up on that part there as well. And a lot of questions around the Elastic File System. Now that was on the C01, it had been around at those times, but a lot more focus on why it's a distinguisher, such as the notion that you can create POSIX compliant file locking and the notion that you can have multiple systems working on the same file system at the same time. So a lot of questions where they were asking you to contrast using S3 versus using EFS, that was pretty tricky because both of them are really, really big on the parallel interaction parts of it. But keep in mind that S3 does not give you a POSIX file system in the way that EFS does. The way that you mount and work with S3 does not work in those same ways. So it was up to us to maybe pull out the distinguishing fact, uh, factors between why EFS, why S3, and how that parallelism was supposed to help us out. Uh, moving on down in, lots of network access control list security group stuff like I mentioned earlier on. Definitely be aware of what the default behaviors are there and how we can use them to block or allow traffic in certain scenarios. A lot of great questions on that part. Um, I mentioned the pricing models earlier on. Quite a few questions about content delivery. When to use S3? Remember those uh, uh, web scale architecture patterns? Using S3 for static content, caching everywhere as much as possible. This includes CloudFront. It also includes using things like ElastiCache as well. And then keeping in mind too that when you're talking caching, Redis is technically considered a special type of data source. We saw some questions on there about using Redis as a data store instead of just thinking of it as a cache, uh, which of course it is a, a caching service because of the in-memory elements that it has. But more eloquently, <laughs> it's a very fancy type of data store that we can use for unique use cases as well. Um, let me just kind of take a look at over some of my notes here. Questions around the serverless offerings with API Gateway and Lambda, of course, um, web application firewall, Quite a few questions around Route 53, both when to use it for front-ending other services, and then also some of the special types of uh, records that we can create, such as like static site failover. So if one of your uh, load balancers is unresponsive, have it fail over to a, uh, some sort of a static web page in S3. You'd wanna know those different sorts of uh, DNS records there as well. And of course, friends, I, I can't really go over my entire exhaustive list of notes that I came back from with the exam. But in the end, I was really impressed with the CO2 because it really, uh, it stepped up that architecting focus. And I had to scratch my head a lot more around some of the answers because it wasn't just straight product service memorization, uh, which I was thankful for. So last things I wanted to kind of send you guys off with there is to keep in mind that I hold a regular study group. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to chat some more and share some of my uh, uh, exam notes with you. And of course, you can reach out to me on Twitter at CloudBart, and you can find me here on YouTube as well and send me messages there. Leave chats at the bottom if you have questions. Love to help you out. It's a big deal for me to make sure that you know where to go to get your certification resources. Now, that being said, let's spend just a few minutes taking a look at some of the uh, resources that I think are gonna be most helpful for getting you prepared for the exam. So if we jump online and take a look over here, I'm, I'm gonna go to Google and look for AWS certifications. Okay, if you jump onto the certification site and then go up here uh, under AWS certifications, uh, let's see, uh, prepare for an exam, cool. And then go on down to the associate level certifications. Here you can see a great little look at all the different resources for the Solutions Architect Associate. Okay, they've got the sample questions and the exam guide and they've got them for the two different releases. So I definitely encourage you to go on here early on in the process and grab yourself a copy of the exam guide, it goes over those domains that you heard me talking about, reliability, performance, security, and then cost optimization. You can kind of see those percentages and a little bit more detail around what they think and how they describe each one of those domains. Should kind of roughly map to what you and I just looked at. On down through there, you also have the sample questions, which I think are just a great resource. I think there's 10 of them on here. Yep. And you can see that they don't actually give you the answers on here. <laughs> so uh, I do very much encourage you to take a look at the exam questions here and go and dig it out. Find the answers, find the supporting documentation, 
make sure you check the product FAQs as well. And then hopefully you can put that to work in your study and prep op uh, options. Back over on the certification page, you can see they also have some of their learning path options. A lot of this is directly uh, leading to AWS's training offerings that they have. Cool. Down here, you have the white papers and notice there it is, AWS well architected. <laughs> they even put a little study tip on here. It says focus on following the white papers. Ah. See, I'm telling you guys, I'm not crazy. These well architected frameworks and those white papers, juicy, delicious fruit just hanging there ready for us to go and grab and start certifying with. And remember friends, this is coming from somebody who makes training material. I want you to come and join CBT Nuggets. I want you to come watch my training material. But AWS does a great job of providing tons of great learning resources for us already. It's what I use to get certified. And as I create training material, and as I prepare for future exams, I am almost always gonna gravitate around the AWS provided training material to help prepare what I'm doing. Do I see those efforts in conflict? Absolutely not. I'm here as a liaison to uh, the exam, to the technical world, to have fun as we go through this potentially stressful journey. And AWS is creating great raw learning content for us to consume. So use what works best for you. <laughs> this is what I think is gonna work well. So moving on down through here, uh, you'll also see that they have the exam readiness training and they have a practice exam as well. So I do very much encourage you to go and take the practice exam before you sit for the actual exam itself. Um, this is gonna give you a chance to get a feel for what the questions look like, the way that the test engine works, and then also, of course, get some good insights into um, how the exam is structured. And of course, go and uh, understand a little bit more about where you need to go and research beyond that. So in the end, my friends, um, the C01 and the C02 are the current solutions architect exams from AWS. The best news I have for you is that if you happen to be studying for the C01 and the C02 got released, you didn't waste your time. Okay, if you haven't scheduled the C01, I do encourage you to go schedule the C02 instead. I'd say generally speaking, you're gonna do just fine on the later release of the test using whatever exam prep you've been doing up to this point already. So hopefully, whew, hopefully that helps some of you rest a little easier at home because I know I get a lot of questions about people saying, should I take which one? Which one should I do? Is the exam studying proper? Is it still gonna work for me? Cool. And so in the end, friends, I hope that this helps you get excited about the C02 exam. Remember, you can check me out on Twitter at CloudBart. You can find me here on YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe. And of course, you can come and check out my Solutions Architect course over at CBT Nuggets by looking for learn.gg slash Bart Castle. On there, you'll find all of my CBT Nuggets training and of course, links to new material that I'm producing on a regular basis as well. So I hope you'll go check that out and reach out to me if you've got any questions or if you wanna hear a little bit more about my Solutions Architect exam notes. I really, really hope that it helps you out. So keep your chin up, friends, study hard, and we'll see you in the cloud.